just occurred to me that like we have like a whole new generation of gamers who don't understand that in video games water kills you. <laughs> like true. that used to just be a given, and now it's not really <laughs> given anymore. Mm-hmm. In our third Thanksgiving special, Jim, Doc, and Chris sit down for another feast of side segments. We'll have ourselves some button mashed potatoes, and what holiday table talk is complete without a nostalgia trip or two? Plus, we debut an all-new segment, Inbox. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 84 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, I'm coming in from the satellite of love. <laughs> also known as the uh, undisclosed location that we uh, mentioned last time. So uh, Jim can't tell us where he actually is right now, but uh, we'll go with the satellite of love for now. Top and secret. <laughs> we're also here with Doc. Hey, everybody. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. It's our... Uh, I, right? Is this... I guess this is our third Thanksgiving that we've been doing the show, but I'm not sure if we did a Thanksgiving special the first time. No, we did. We had the giant, uh, like, seven-person. Yeah, yeah uh, it was out of my house. Mm-hmm. I was cooking in the middle of it. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone in our uh, third Thanksgiving special. And like last year, it's going to be our um, our Feast of Side segments. We're not going to do a meaty topic today. We're just going to uh, do a whole bunch of side segments and bounce from topic to topic. So, it should be lots of fun. Oh, we're going to fill up on dressing and mashed taters, a <laughs> couple of biscuits, Maybe some cranberry sauce, mm. but no turkey. No turkey. Yeah. It's our side <laughs> Chautauqua. I love it. <laughs> that again. Uh, so let's go ahead and kick off the feast with some button moshed potatoes. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Zombie. Z-O-M-B-I. Now, Jim, you were telling me that this is a game that's actually off of Wii. Is that right? Yeah, it was on, it was on the Wii, Wii U. Wii U. Wii yeah, U. Okay. Originally so, on the Wii U. Yeah. So it's called what? Like Zombie U? Zombie U. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I didn't play Zombie U, but I played Zombie on uh, PS4. It was actually free for PS Plus a couple of months ago, but I finally got around to actually playing it and was pleasantly surprised. One of the things that I really liked about it is that your death is semi-permanent. There are basically two modes. Um, the first is where you play, and when you die, you're done. And then the second is whenever you die, you take on a new character who is randomly generated, and you sort of continue the story or the meta story from there. Uh, if you want to get your stuff back, you're going to have to go find your previous character, kill them, and take their stuff. So your previous character is a zombie now? Yes. Nice. Uh, so that was kind of my moment. And uh, whenever I got to that that little moment, I was like, okay, this, this game is a little bit different. It's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's kind of fun. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's still just a kind of a running gun zombie killer. But it's, it's less of uh, the Walking Dead telltale and more of uh, the Walking Dead TV series in its tone. Mm. You know what I'm saying? If you ever get into that mode where you're just like, dude, I just need to kill some zombies. (laughs) Check out zombie. We we all have those days. I know we all do. I mean, you know, I I had one uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, (laughs) anyway the point is that i'm not going to mention politics Uh, the the, the point is this um it it has a really unique setting uh it's it's london and it starts actually in the london underground which is the subways and uh kind of goes out from there and and i'm kind of at a point now not too far into the game where um i'm actually at the palace you know at the the british um palace and, and you make your way into sort of these iconic London places, and it's a lot of fun, um, especially if you've actually been to those places, which is always a treat. But uh, really, what I think it comes down to is there, there's some really nice zombie hacking, zombie shooting gameplay in it. You really genuinely fear for your life a little bit, um, and you understand that 
there's five bullets in your gun or whatever it is that you got to get limited space in your inventory. Um, you have to decide, am I going to take this with me because I need it to survive? Or am I going to leave it in the trunk? Because if I die, the next character can have it and it'll free up space in my inventory for the cool loot I'm going to bring back. Hmm. It's really kind of meta in that sense. That's kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, you know, give it a try. It's not, uh, in terms of, of game vocabulary, you know, game verbs, it's not that revolutionary or different or anything like that, nor should it be. Mm. It is exactly what you expect. Uh, you grab the controller, you go out, you kill some zombies, uh, you know, you, you hack them, you hope you don't get pounced and bitten. Mm. Um, and then if you do, you're going to have to deal with those consequences. There are a few little moments that are really fun, like the, the auto gun and things like that, where you can uh, just, just have some fun with it. Um, but at the same time, the, the story comes from a guy who's on the other end of the radio with you, uh, feels a little bit Firewatch-like, and, and he's basically saying, uh, okay, this is what you need to do, here's the next thing, I've set up these safe houses, and, and, and you need to, to go follow my instructions, do this, do that. And um, you, you get into this, this areas and, and start down a path and go, you do not want to go down there. Do you seriously want to fight like that whole pack? Do you, you want to fight it? Oh, it, it's your life. You do what you want, but... No, you, you don't want to do that. And so there's these great little moments like that. And, um, an, it, an alarm got set off, uh, that kind of thing. Is like, oh, crud, an alarm went off. Ah. <laughs> and so it's really, really wonderful. It's very linear, very scripted, that sort of thing. But it's uh, genuinely fun. Zombie. Z-O-M-B-I. Check it out. Now you're playing this on PS4? I'm playing it on PS4. Yeah. So did they give it a, a graphical update over the Wii Oh, yeah, version? I think so. Um, I mean, they must have. Mm -hmm. They must have. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not a huge Wii U player. Mm -hmm. uh, I've held the controller once or twice, mm -hmm. but um, I, this this held up. It felt really um, like right on par with what I expect from PS4. So gotcha. Yeah, cool. Because the Wii U is it's I think it's it might be technically slightly more powerful than the, like the Xbox 360 and the mm -hmm. PS3 were, mm -hmm. but it's approximately equivalent to those. Right. Um, Graphically, at least. Yeah, at, at least as far as hardware power goes. Sure. So. Very cool. Well, the game that I've been playing is one that I've talked about on the show before, Steins Gate. Um, I finally finished it, um, all six endings. And, it, and is, is Steins Gate, is that... Because that sounded familiar when you mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that based on an anime series? Uh, the anime series is based on it. It's based okay. on the game, the visual novel. Um, and as visual novels go, I, I heard from a lot of people that it's probably one of the better ones out there. Uh, I'm not a huge visual novel fan, but you know, I've I've played in the genre a little bit. You know, Phoenix Wright, you could probably call a visual novel more so than like any sort of adventure game. It's kind of like a visual novel with some puzzle elements. Um, Steins Gate is definitely very much a visual novel, um, and it is fantastic. Um, I, I mentioned how it was intriguing me before. It had a little bit of that problem that a lot of visual novels have where they kind of you know, do too much exposition, and it takes a little while to sort of ramp things up and to get into it. Um, and I will say to their credit that when they had that in the first few chapters, um, it, was, it was good. It was entertaining enough to keep me interested, and it became important later on in the story. I still think they could have made they could have afforded to trim some of it down just to streamline things and to streamline the story. Um, but once you get really into the meat of it, where you start to have some more branching and the way that things uh, can turn out, um, it is really, really good. Um, each of the six endings that you can do, there's basically five sort of standard endings, endings if you will, and then there's the true ending, which is basically the, the hardest one to get to. And if you're doing it without a guide, it might be a little bit difficult to intuit um, how you're supposed to get to it because you have to um, you know, make the correct responses to people who are emailing you at certain times and that sort of thing. Um, but they, one of the things I really love about it is a lot of video games, when they have multiple endings, branching endings, they tend to sort of do the thing where, like, oh, you made the wrong choice, and we're going to sort of briefly describe how everything just goes to hell, and then you die, and that's sort of one of the bad endings, right? Um, in this one, each ending kind of focuses on a different character, and each ending really takes its time and um, feels meaningful. It, it feels, um, like, really well thought out. And um, each one has like its own sort of emotional impact. And what you realize is as you play through these endings, like you, you kind of get the sense, even if you don't go through each ending, but with each ending, um, you sort of realize uh, what could have been. And that makes um, giving some of those things up uh, that much more uh, heartbreaking. I'm not going to go into exactly what happens in the plot, but suffice it to say that you know different people, different characters, kind of have their own hopes and dreams and their own conflicts that you see played out in each of their endings, and they lose out on some of that stuff if you decide to make the other choice. 
Um, so, so in, in this game, you said it's a visual novel, essentially? Yes. So the gameplay is you're given like dialogue choices and that impacts the story. So is it's mo- it's gameplay? mostly just text that they're reading off to you and then you have a cell phone that you can pull out where occasionally as you're talking to people you'll get messages and you can reply back by selecting certain <laughs> phrases within the text message or it's yeah. emails technically. This is pre-smartphones. Um, You've got mail. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, you get messages from people, you select a phrase, and you can kind of preview what it is you're going to say back to them. And mm-hmm. then you send that, and that's one way of interacting. The other way you interact, and really, this is something that I want to mention, too, because the first time I played, I didn't fully understand um, what capability I did or didn't have to um, use the phone to make different choices. Because, again, everything is done through your phone. And so you have this time travel device called the uh, the phone wave name subject to change. And they say that every time, in parentheses, name subject to change. Um, you call it, and basically when you call it with a particular number at a particular time, um, you can basically do what's called a time leap, where you're not physically time traveling, you're basically uploading your memories to a previous self. Um, so basically, uh, you a week ago suddenly has all the memories of you a week later. Oh, is this um, like a quantum leap thing? Kind of, sort of. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. They explain or- it fully in the in the visual novel. But suffice it okay. to say, the, mo- the means of time travel is information, not physical time travel. Uh, so kind of like having, having that knowledge. Um, and so basically, at key moments in the game, you can choose whether or not you actually make that phone call. And... Um, when I when I didn't realize that I basically I actually needed to myself pull out the phone and make that phone call, I figured that it was just going to either do it for me if it was part of the story, or was giving me, you know, we're we're used to kind of like, do you do this or do you do this? And you have like a little menu option that you select. Um, the first time through, I actually intended to make that phone call. Um, but I didn't because I just kept hitting A and I was waiting for the text. And like basically the, the character deliberates for, you know, a few lines of dialogue before uh, making a decision one way or the other. And if you just don't pull out the phone to make that call, you get one of the endings that's basically you chose not to make that call. And so I figured, like, okay, well, maybe I wasn't supposed to. Um, so I saw one of the endings where you just don't do anything. It was still a super good ending, um, even without that. Um, or even even though it didn't go quite the way I intended it to. But then when you go back after you've cleared it once, you start to see this little icon at the end of certain dialogues, um, or mm-hmm. certain lines of dialogue that tell you, here's the place where you could pull out your phone and do something. So it's letting you know that here's a place where you could branch. And so between that little indication and like a little bit of reading that I did online, um, I figured out that what you have to do is when you have that stuff, you call someone in particular to make the story branch a little bit. And so um, that, is the, that is the main way by which you choose what happens, is by either making a phone call to jump back in time or choosing not to, or choosing to send a message or not send a message. It's going to change how things play out. Interesting. And, and plenty of bananas in microwaves. Yeah, the, there are lots of bananas in microwave. There's chicken in microwaves. Um, there's, uh, there's, wait, 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 there's chicken in microwaves, too. Yeah, like, uh, like popcorn chicken, kind of. It, it's it's okay. called juicy chicken number one. I'm actually not sure if it's like popcorn chicken or if it's fried chicken or something else. But, uh, yeah. It's a chicken-like substance. Really, really excellent game. Um, I would highly recommend it, even if you don't think you're that into visual novels. Um, just a really fantastic story. Um like thematically and the character development, all this different stuff. Um, very smart. Um, I think it's a time travel story that's aware of the mistakes that are often made in time travel stories. Um, and they very they do a really great job of keeping everything consistent and thinking through implications. And um, it's it's a great example of science fiction that isn't just about like here's a cool thing. It's here's a cool thing, and what does that mean? Um, so even if you're not that into visual novels, I'd recommend giving this a try. It took me, my, my play time officially is like 41 hours, but that includes a lot of times when I would just leave it running and go and take care of other stuff, so it's probably not quite accurate. I would guess it's probably about 30, all said, depending on how quickly you read. Cool. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. So um, I've been looking for another game to play, and I actually picked up a rebought Grand Theft Auto San Andreas because it was on sale for the PS4. Uh, this is one of my favorite Grand Theft Auto games. I'm a huge Grand Theft Auto fan, and I don't want to talk so much about my experience of playing it. Although I do, I'll touch a little bit on that. I actually want to talk about the impact that San Andreas had on the series itself because San Andreas was really the first time that the Grand Theft Auto series. It sort of bridged this gap between 
campy, ridiculous kind of missions that were, you know, very, had a lot of like, uh, toilet humor, kind of, you know, very immature kind of jokes, but also they had a lot of social commentary and satire. And uh, both both of the American system, American cultures, uh, and just in general of um, just the way of life, or at least how the British perceive the way of life of, in, of Americans. And it's something that if you think of, like, the character of um, the unnamed protagonist in Grand Theft Auto 3, and then also um, Tommy Versetti in... Vice City, these were larger than life cartoon characters. Like they were essentially mm. cartoon characters. They weren't really people. And so you felt justified when you would go around and just randomly murder someone because it didn't mean anything. It was you're a cartoon character. But in in San Andreas, this is the first time that you're playing an actual person. So true, you yeah. play you play CJ, uh, Carl Johnson, and the very first thing that happens is you, you find out that he's returning home to San Andreas because his mother died. And so even though he's a he's this, you know, former gang member of this area, he's clearly a not a good person. At the same time, you're immediately grounded with this, oh, he has a family. Mm-hmm. Oh, he has people that, that that he cares about. And one of the first things that happens too is that that you have you've literally done nothing wrong yet. You're you're in a taxi cab driving back to your old neighborhoods. So you can go to your mom's funeral and Cops pull over the taxi, pull you out of the car, and essentially just harass you hmm. because they sort of they sort of know you by reputation. But you haven't done anything. You're not wanted for any crime. So right off the bat, you're being harassed. And by the way, you're being harassed by um, Samuel L. Jackson, who plays <laughs> Officer Tenpenny. Yeah. By the way, which is actually very cool, really cool casting. He's one of the uh, the corrupt cops that sort of plays off CJ. And of course, very quickly, you uh, you kind of justified them coming after you right away because you almost immediately get involved in some very dark and criminal activities. But it's a Grand Theft Auto game. You have to expect mm-hmm. that. Of course, um, very but Pulp this was Fiction. A game that, that, whole, <laughs> that whole sequence yeah, is no, very Pulp Fiction. Press the skip button again. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see what happens. Press skip again. Uh, no, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of... Uh, of course, there's still a lot of the Grand Theft Auto humor in it, which I feel like um, when they went to GTA 4 they kind of stepped back a lot on some of that humor to focus on the social commentary. The immigrant experience is what they focused yeah, on. Yeah, maybe that's why I didn't like it as much. It, it felt too same real here. or something. Hmm. Right, same here. Yeah. I think they went a little too far with it, and they realized their mistake, and in Grand Theft Auto V, they kind of stepped back a bit and sort of like played... I think they had the perfect balance. But in San Andreas, they were still kind of finding that balance, mm-hmm. and it was something that really influenced Grand Theft Auto IV... Um, of course, five as well, but also Red Dead Redemption. The other other games that they've worked on, it's really influenced their sort of storytelling style. It was the first time they really, I feel like they they developed into this very mature um, storytelling focused company. That makes sense. Uh, a, RDR two has been announced, so that's going to be interesting to see what the humor level on that one ends up being. Since yeah, there are I'm really, some sort I'm really of farcical elements to to the first one, that trailer looked gorgeous. Yeah, it was amazing. yeah. <laughs> And, and that's the other thing. I, I, I did want to just touch on a little bit of just sort of the shock when you go back and play a game. Because I hadn't played this game pretty much since it first came out, when I first played it all the way through. And I remember being very impressed by the graphics. And this just kind of once again cements this um, notion that I have that 3D graphics just don't hold up as well as 2D graphics. Because yeah, mm-hmm. I, I was so impressed by how this game looked when it first came out. I'm playing it now, and... You know, I can see the models are basically just, you know, like squares or like rectangular shapes, <laughs> like sort of quadrilaterals. They're very, very low poly objects. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the textures are really terrible. Um, it, I had I a mean, similar it, experience trying to get back good. into Vice City. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, even if no, you look it, at. Um, even if you look at like say Xbox 360, like early early um, graphics of that generation, mm-hmm. uh, like they got better over time, and so like you can still definitely tell the difference between say like you know PS4 and PS3, Xbox One, Xbox 360, but especially the yeah. really early stuff, like the 2006 stuff, like we were blown away by like man, look how many polys this is, and look at the shading, and you know like you know better physics and all this different stuff compared to the previous generation, but. Oh my goodness! Does it look awful now? You know, right? Um, it, and, it is, and it, it's really shocking sometimes. 
Yeah, it's, it's not to the point where I can't play it. Like, it's not like I'm, I'm playing, oh, I can't play it because it looks so bad. Not at all. Yeah. I actually still enjoy it. But I kind of wish they had done a remastered version like they did with Bully. Because mm-hmm. I went back not too long ago. I, I talked about playing Bully maybe about, you know, six, eight months ago. And they did a remastered version where they did a lot of, like, um, upscaling on the textures and, and kind of upscaled some of the models. And um, it still looks old and kind of antiquated, but it doesn't look anywhere near as bad. And they just, they right. just didn't do that. They just re, they just re released San Andreas on the PS4. Oh, gotcha. um, I'm still glad they did. I'm still enjoying it. I'm I'm almost all the way through the first third of the game. You know, they kind of have the, the different sections, the different parts of the cities, um, San Andreas proper before you go to San Fierro and then uh, Los Venturas. A couple other things I wanted to mention, just because these were some of the things they experimented with in this game, um, role playing elements. That was big. That was a big addition in. Uh, San Andreas. So you actually had stats. You had things like muscle, fat, respect, stamina. I mean, these were different characteristics your character had that you actually had to build up by doing things like you go to a gym and you exercise a lot, you get your stamina up and you lose weight. Yeah, or you lift that. weight till you gain muscle. Or, uh oh, you're gonna you might die because you haven't eaten food for a while. You better go out and go eat some food, but don't eat too much because you might get fat. Mm-hmm. So into fat and <laughs> you, you could, and that, that's part of the fun too, is you can make your character like kind of look how you want, um, which is something that I'm a little disappointed they never actually ran with in the GTA series, but it was a cool experiment. I remember that that being sort of revolutionary at the time that, that there were these RPG elements in a GTA mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. Is that distracting or is it not distracting? And I think if you play and they to have it, it's your... distracting. But if you allow it to be emergent, it's not. Mm-hmm. Right, and they and they had it. it. It actually really impacts the game, and at some points, it is actually disruptive in my experience. Uh, just because um, you have to use a gun a lot in order to get your gun skill up for that particular gun. Like yeah. it's, it's that it's that advanced. Like for example, like running. There were certain missions where I couldn't complete the mission like I was supposed to because I couldn't chase someone down on foot because my stamina wasn't good enough. I would just, right. I, I couldn't do it. I had to pull a gun out and shoot the guy in the legs and then run up to him. Uh-huh. Like I sort of had to cheese the mission because I literally just couldn't chase him down. I mean, actually, I think that's kind of cool as an, as an emergent property. If you go into it knowing that that sort of stuff can happen, I think that the fact that your gameplay could be that drastically altered uh, by the system, I think is pretty cool. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. So a couple of things they added that had not been done in a GTA game before. So um, they added stealth. They had stealth missions in this game, which were pretty interesting. Um, You could hide in the shadows. You could sneak up and do a stealth kill on people. Um, I believe this game came out before Manhunt, I want to say. Is that correct, Doc? Do you know if if this was before Manhunt? Because Manhunt Um, had these, like, some of these... Yeah. ideas as well. It might have been. I'm pretty sure it was before Manhunt. Yeah, it would have um, been. It would have been before Manhunt because definitely um, before Manhunt too. Right, definitely. Um, because and I, that was I, one that had even more stealth elements in it. Was Manhunt two? I, I do they remember both did, but Manhunt two. I do remember more. the Manhunt. Some of the Manhunt elements making their way into the next iteration of of GTA, and that yeah. that was kind of interesting to, to yeah. see how those two properties interplayed, basically. Hmm. And then the other big thing that they added into GTA was you could swim now. This was a huge thing. And we sort of like kind of forgotten it, but it used to be in GTA, if you got in the water, you would just be dead. Like <laughs> oh, I you just fall in water. That. Yeah, and it's <laughs> I like it's like never it's like, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> the water is hot lava essentially. And but yeah, in this basically. game, no, not only Right, not only can you swim, but you also have a swimming skill. So if your swimming skill isn't good enough, you can start swimming for a while and your stamina is not good enough and you just you'll drown for that reason, but at yep. least you have a chance. It just occurred to me that like we have like a whole new generation of gamers who don't understand that in video games water kills you. <laughs> like true. that used to just be a given and now it's not silly <laughs> given anymore. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Huh. Yeah, even the first the- Assassin's Creed. Uh, there yeah. were all these little things you needed to pick up out there on the docks, but if you fell off of anything, you were gone. You were dead. <laughs> we need to make gamers I mean, fear a lot of the water equipment. again. <laughs> That's maybe what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Leaping like a gazelle while carrying 75 pounds of <laughs> steel. That's, yeah. that's going to do it. Your clothes look like heavy leather, too. You don't want to get that wet. That's true. That's a, a very good point. <laughs> now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Yeah, so recently in uh, one of our role-playing groups, we tried out The Warren, um, which 
some of you who are into tabletop RPGs might be familiar with Apocalypse World. Yeah, it's about Warren Buffett. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, the, uh, the in-depth political um, intrigues of... Uh, no. It's, <laughs> it's about rabbits. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is about rabbits. Um, probably, uh, and we've, we've mentioned this on the podcast before, actually, when we are talking about our uh, oddball and uh, non-conventional or non-traditional tabletop RPGs. Yeah, yeah, Brian turned us on to this game. Mm-hmm. Um... It is a game in which you play as rabbits, um, along the lines of things like Watership Down. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're anthropomorphic rabbits in the sense that they can think and reason, all this stuff like humans, but they're not anthropomorphic in the sense that, like, they're not just humanoids with rabbit heads. Thank you for not saying what's up, Doc. Hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's using the Power by the Apocalypse system, and so, you know, pretty much every Power by the Apocalypse game has the idea of the apocalypse in it, and so in this one, you're playing as rabbits, and humans are the apocalypse. Um, so it's all about the survival of your warren. Uh, and so I was actually the one GMing this. And uh, I have to say, actually, at least for this group that we were playing with, um, I've never actually I've been I've played in a few Power by the Apocalypse games before, including Dungeon World, um, but I've never actually run any of these games. And I found that with the group that we were playing with, um, it was a really great fit for us. I was able to kind of uh, go in without a lot of pre-planning. I had kind of a general sense of where things might go, but really it came down to what the game is designed to do. Playing to see what happens. Um, the player moves uh, sort of direct you in a certain way by like if you if you fail or if you sort of just do moderately well on a roll, it says you get to do this, but then also in- incorporate this complication. Or um, you know if they fail outright, then the GM has a certain list of things that they're kind of able to do, um, or at least su- suggestions of what they can do, um, which they then. Uh, kind of just tailored to the situation. So I found that it worked really well for me. Uh, Doc, what were your impressions of playing it? Well, you know, GM aside, uh, no. <laughs> the GM was really awful. Honestly, but... <laughs> this was this was not my first chance to play in a uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game, but um, it, I, I think it, it really um, is a perfect setting for what Powered by the Apocalypse is supposed to be. So if, that, if that makes some sense, um, I, I think that the idea of tell the story and then, uh, when necessary, use some abilities and, and make some roles, mm-hmm. uh, less is more mm-hmm. in that system. Uh, that's worth mentioning that Powered by the Apocalypse, its philosophy when it's being played correctly, is they, they even call it a conversation right. between the GM and the players. Yeah. You just say, "Here's what I'm doing," and the GM describes the results. And really, you're not supposed to, you're not you're not thinking in terms of, "Oh, I'm going to use my ability here. I'm going to use this skill here." Mm-hmm. That sort of thing like a lot of other RPGs tend to do. You really just say, "Here's what I do," and the GM says yes or no, and then what happens? And then every now and then you say something the GM will recognize as a trigger for a move. Yeah. And so it's not moves first at the story later. It's story first and then moves second. So uh, given that, and, and with that as sort of the, the setup, I guess, uh, I think actually you did a really great job knowing that, uh, using that system in the way that it was intended to be used. And and so because of that, we were able to create our little world. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was kind of interesting is we actually played it in a post-apocalyptic setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a series of games going on uh, that was in a bigger world, and we used a, sort of a different system of the week, mm-hmm. if you will, and we, and we did kind of a rotation. It's the setting and, we generated with the quiet year. Yeah, yeah, the quiet, the quiet year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's funny because um, everybody at the table had their opportunity to do a GM, and you chose the warrant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and some of us are sitting there going, oh, come on. Stop it. Really? Yeah. Come on. I mean, you know, to be fair, the one that I chose was, was actually um, actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I just used the mechanic, and, yeah. and, and Shia was turned into zombies. But uh, ir- irrelevant. Mm. Um, what, what I really liked about the Warren is that sense that your character could very easily die. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if you're going into it with the idea of this is going to be a long campaign, we're going to play for months, we're going to... Nah, choose something else. Mm. Um, well, you can play a long-term campaign, but then it becomes more about the Warren and less about these individual characters. Right. Well, that's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Um, the Warren almost feels like a character itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what was neat was, in, in the scenario you did, you brought in a second Warren, mm-hmm. the one that was um, inside the post-apocalyptic shopping mall and the mm-hmm. one that was legendary, mm-hmm. uh, and then ours, mm-hmm. which was out by the wall. And 
well, this was all about food. It was about getting food. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the humans, the survivors of the apocalypse and the humans, um, and how that all interplayed. And there were just some, some terrifying moments there where um, you, you realize that a, a character, an NPC or whatever, um, who is this rabbit, has been caught by a human and just killed. Mm-hmm. Just because from a human perspective, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're starving. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, I caught a rabbit. Yay, this is great. And it's we're, we're having stew tonight. Yeah, you can almost... And that actually happened. It happened, yeah. And it was a major NPC it <laughs> happened to. Um, and it was sort of my fault. <laughs> and I felt really bad. Um, and, and so you've got the sort of the human campaign over here where, you know, you're in the forest and you're with your elf and your dwarf and your human and, and you're like, um, I will go catch food. And you go catch a rabbit. And you come back, you know, and you move on with the scenario. Yeah. Plays the rabbit. <laughs> it's, it's horrific. It's terrifying. <laughs> uh, so I really, I really recommend it. Anybody who's either a fan of the um, powered by the apocalypse systems, or wants to find a sort of a soft way in (pun intended) uh, fluffy maybe <laughs> soft and fluffy <laughs> soft and fluffy way in. Um, you know on this uh, this Thanksgiving holiday mm. maybe maybe roll up uh, or roll out the characters mm. I guess and. Uh, Give it a try, and it'll well, be worth mentioning too. Horrific. One of the things I really love about the Powered by the Apocalypse games is that each one, yes, they have a lot of the same core principles, but it's not in the same way that like you take GURPS or D twenty well, and just very change the aesthetic. Very, very they true. actually can change the mechanics in fairly significant ways. And one of the things that really stands out to me about the Warren is that the mechanics, like the way that you, the abilities you have as a player character, uh, make you play like a rabbit. It's not like I'm going to confront this head yes. on and defeat it. It is I'm going to evade. I'm going to outsmart. I'm going to. Uh, there's even a panic mechanic where uh, every now and then mm-hmm. I would ha- make something happen and tell you guys to uh, roll to resist panic. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't resist panic, there was actually I think one time Doc where you did panic. Yeah. And the GM well, totally gets, panicked. Yeah. The GM gets to choose uh, one of three things that your rabbit does. It's a uh, fright, flight, or fight. Uh huh. Um, and so if you fright, you know you basically just like either go berserk and go crazy into panic, or you just like. Fr- freeze up and can't do anything. There's fight where, like, just despite your best, uh, uh, whatever might be smart in this situation, you just charge in and try to fight the thing, or, um, you run away. And, um, I decided to make you freeze up because in that particular case you were, uh, you, you hit your panic threshold when a little girl was uh, wanting to keep you as a pet. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Domesticated. I, yeah. <laughs> but um, it, it, I just really thought that the, the system overall does a great job of um, – you know, recreating the feel of being a rabbit. Yeah. And so that's what Powered by the Apocalypse games do best um, when they're when they're designed well and when they're played properly is r- get you a very particular feel, a very particular style of gameplay. And mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. I agree. Sounds like an interesting game, actually, to try it out sometime. Well, I want to talk very quickly about a board-slash-card game called The King's Forge. Um, if, uh, if you've liked any kind of dice building game which is kind of popular right now uh, check out King's Forge because uh, there are a couple expansions to it and um, to me it feels very much like Roll for the Galaxy now Roll for the Galaxy um, what you do is you build dice you put them in your cup and you explore the galaxy and you roll and that's your citizenry and that sort of thing very similar kinds of things except here the dice are actually your materials that you're working with in a fantasy setting to try to actually craft things for the king. First person to craft four things, which are all in sort of the public space, uh, becomes the new uh, king's forge. And so uh, with some of the expansions, you can have apprentices and you can have new objects to craft and you can have new um, areas to gather resources and that sort of a thing. Uh, But there's three phases. And the first is to uh, go out and, and gather the resources and plan for the crafting phase. And then you take all the dice that you've gotten during that phase and you roll them in a big dice pool. And based on that, then you can choose and select, if you've rolled high enough, which of the items you want to actually craft and take in. The neat thing about it is, because everyone is doing this together, there's a lot more interplay, there's a lot more sabotage, there's a lot more, I'm going to take thing X, not thing Y. That part of it actually reminded me very much of Pillars of the Earth, which is one of my favorite resource management games. A little bit like uh, maybe Agricola or something like that. But in this particular case, that really kicks it to the next level for me compared to Roll for the Galaxy, which sometimes can feel like four people or five people playing uh, a game of solitaire together. (laughs) 
And so, um, you know, I'm doing my thing with my exploration of the galaxy over here. You're doing your thing with your exploration of the galaxy over there. We go through each of the phases. And oh, I better, I better hurry because you're, you've got, you've got, you know, six things on your tableau. Um, and and really, this uh, King's Forge, what ends up happening is a lot more interaction. Now, there's a couple of little subtle rules that if you don't follow, uh, can potentially break the game. The first time we played it, we missed that you're supposed to refresh cards, and the game was really, really slow. It's not intended to be that. It's intended to be fast-paced, um, lots of churn with dice, uh, like burning dice, things like that. Uh, they go away forever. You have to get new ones, that kind of a thing. But uh, it's supposed to be about 20 minutes per player. We played a f uh, five-player game, and it took us a couple hours the first time, but then the second time, uh, really, really different. Uh, felt fantastic and a lot of fun and everything that I'd love about those kinds of dice building games built right in so uh, give it a, give it a check out and uh, see if King's Forge is, uh, is good for you believe it or not we're not always playing games every now and then we like to talk about the other stuff Recently, I've been watching this uh, new series that came out on HBO called Westworld. It's based on the uh, 1973 film, uh, I've totally which was seen starring, that. yeah, it was starring Yul Brenner, and it was, of course, written and directed by uh, Michael Crichton. Uh, and it sort of serves as a precursor to Jurassic Park. Very similar idea that there's a theme park, and the uh, people are supposed to go there and be able to observe this other world in Jurassic Park it was dinosaurs in this case it's the old west but I'm there sure uh, of course something goes wrong and now the creatures in the park try to kill them that's the the premise behind the movie oh, yeah. I'm starting to think that Crichton like had some traumatic childhood experience with theme parks and uh, probably did <laughs> that's manifested <laughs> itself in this way he, so it's it's like he, it's, if your childhood defines who you are he had some traumatic experience in a theme park and he was really into dinosaurs in the wild west yes uh, which, I mean, but what kid's not into dinosaurs in the Wild West? Those exactly. are like the two, the two staples for young boys, Maybe right? Maybe he got a so, disease. So anyway, so... That's, no, that's where Andromeda yeah. String came from. <laughs> so uh, the Westworld series, though, it kind of takes it in a different direction. Um, so far, I'm, I'm about six episodes into the series, and we really haven't had this um, robots go crazy moment. That really hasn't happened. I mean, there's there's been... They're moving in a certain direction, clearly, but... Um, the themes are more about, well, let me kind of ex explain the park because it takes a sort of a different track than the, uh, or a different take on it than the film did. So it honestly feels like it's been heavily influenced by open world games, um, mm. maybe even M MMOs to an extent, but especially open world games like Grand Theft Auto, dare I say, Red Dead Redemption, is that too, that too on the nose? <laughs> it might be. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that, so for very high paying clients, they can go to this place known as Westworld, where it is essentially a, a living, breathing theme park, where, of course, there'll be other guests there like yourself, but um, you get to dress up like a cowboy. In fact, one of the first scenes, one of the, one of the characters, um, he's picking his hat, a white hat or a black hat. And the significance is sort of, of course, he can do whatever he wants in the park, but the idea are, is... Are you, the, are you the, the, good, the good guy sheriff or the, the, the outlaw? Eggs. Exactly, because you can do yeah. either one. And they have all these little quests when you get to town. The, the, the opening town is called Sweetwater. It's like it's like your hub hub area of an MMO or an open world hmm. game. And the idea is that in this first area, um, everything is very easy. Like you're not going to get really hurt or anything like that. And of course, in the park, you can't die. However, you can actually get hurt. Like hmm. you could get like punched in the face or like beat up or something. You could get thrown in prison or something like that. Um, they do have people that are always monitoring you on the outside to keep make sure that nothing gets too intense. But the idea is that the farther away that you go from this central hub, the Sweetwater Town, the more intense it gets. And, it's harder to regulate. Well, no, no, they do it on purpose. They want you oh, to okay. you as the as the player, as the guest. They call you a guest if you're you're one of the people that's coming to the park paying all this money. They want you to be able to control your experience level. So they warn you at the start. It's like the farther out you go, the more intense it gets. Hmm. The more you you could be in some sort of danger. You're still not going to die, but you could be in danger in the sense that you might get beat up, or you could experience like you could see someone like brutally killed in front of you. If you're not prepared for that, don't go out there. Now, of course, you they know? also said you weren't going to die at Jurassic Park. Right, right. And so far, <laughs> so far, uh, so far, that part hasn't been broken yet. But okay. um, what what I do want to what I do want to kind of talk about is this this idea that once. The big selling point for this is that once you're there, you can do 
anything. And the 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 people that are there in this park, the the quote hosts, they're not mechanical androids like they were in the film. They're mm. actually synthetic. They basically build people. They sort of like craft them from. I say people, they're not really people, or are they? That's kind of the point. But mm. they sort of craft them from um, synthetic material. So they still have programming. They're still they still have electronics that power their their brain, but their bodies are when it comes to um, like all their interior parts, organs, and you know uh, blood, that kind of thing. They they all they would seem very human. Like you'd have to really cut into their heads to know that they're not human. That's kind of how close like, they've um, gotten. Do do androids dream of electric sheep? Yeah, actually, that's... yeah. Or Blade Runner for those of you who haven't. <laughs> Read uh, Philip K. Dick. Yeah, and if and if you right. read actual, uh, you know, the actual book, what you discover is that they're they're not mechanical at all. They're actually flesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the replicants. Just, it, yes, the replicants are. Yeah, it's it's sort of like a weird synth flesh kind of thing. And, it's it's and, just and it like really, that. it really reads. When was it written? Fifties, forties? I forget. Um, uh, no, yeah, no, no, no. Anyway. It, it would have probably been sixties or sixties, maybe seventies, probably sixties. The, the, I, film I the, 80s. the film came out in the eighties. The film was the eighties. The film was, I think, eighty five. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly. But um, yeah. you know, the the point is, it it really reads the, the the lack of current technology and understanding of that. He, they weren't called clones, but they they were kind of kind of clones. Mm-hmm. But one of the distinguishing fe- features of them was that they were cold. And and there's a passage that I remember. He has like sex with one of the replicants, and and yeah. it's talking about the cold loins. And I'm just like. <laughs> Okay, that's weird. But it see, really got it across. See, this one, uh, Westworld sort of, they, and part of it is because it is an HBO show, but they really go into the sort of degenerate nature of a lot of the people that come to this park. Um, they're these sort of like pamper, a lot of them are essentially pampered rich folk. I mean, that's the whole thing, because this is a very mm. expensive experience. And so they come here, and it's it's like, you know, all the the um, the Fox News reports about people that play GT, GTA and all they want to do is run around and like murder people and like bang hookers. That's like <laughs> what Fox thinks of, G- of GTA games. Well, that's basically right. what, but which is not really true. They actually do have a lot of story. There's a lot of other things you can do. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. No, this is basically in Westworld. They basically take that concept to the extreme. They intentionally craft these stories for these people. That yes, there are quests in town that you can accept, but a lot of the people that go there are pretty much scumbags that just want to take advantage of these quote people that aren't really people because mm-hmm. they won't remember anything. And part of part of that experience is that you can kill any any of them at any time. You have like special weapons that only work on, like you can kill the the hosts is what they're called. Like that's what they call the synthetic the synthetics or hosts. You can kill mm-hmm. them, but they can't hurt you. I mean, they can like punch mm-hmm. you in the face or something, but, they, but their guns won't even do anything to you if they shoot you. They might like. If they hit you in the right spot, it might like maybe give you like a slight bruise at most, but that's it. Hmm. So you can essentially do what you want with impunity. There's also things like they're not technically allowed to lie to you, or like you know they have all these like special rules, almost like a like an Asimov, you know, yeah, laws of robotics kind of situation. Huh. But um, of course, the the underlying theme of the show not only is just you know what does it mean to be human, but also there's this. Um, search for meaning concept where some of them start to become aware of what they are. And mm. um, I don't want to spoil anything, but this, this idea of, you know, what does it mean to be um, human and what does it mean to be a sentient being? And this quest uh, kind of takes them on um, both a physical form and then also a, you know, metaphysical sort of a philosophical form as well but uh, they actually do have a physical quest where one of the old programmers who is no longer in the park that designed a lot of these um, synthetics designed them with this desire to find this quote maze that if they can find the sensor of the maze they might actually be able to become free Hmm. is this Hmm. idea and so that's kind of like the big underlying like concept that they run with in the show um so just to give, uh, I, have, just, I have a feeling the maze is just a, uh, a another term for like your inner mind or something like could that. Be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. See, that's the thing. I don't know. But um, I will say that some of the things that that hit me, at least when I was when I was uh, watching it, was immediately I was struck by this notion that unlike the film, it feels like the humans are the bad guys. Like I can't really escape that notion. Mm. Um, one of the main characters is Ed Harris who he plays the man in black character that early on you, they really want you to think that I I think they want you to think that he's one of the synthetics, but he's not, Hmm. he's a human, but he's also incredibly brutal and 
not really a good person, but at the same time, you're sort of thinking, well, wait a minute, but he's, he's doing all, like, for example, I mean, he, you know, he scalps people to like, look, look at their, look inside their heads to get information. He like drains people's blood just to like, use it for, to like, you know, siphon it off to someone else, hmm. you know, kill, kills people with impunity just to get information, things like that. Sounds um, like a good guy. Yeah. He very much plays like the black hat sort of character, but at the same time, it's like, well, how, how different is that from like a video game experience? You know, of yeah. course the big difference is these characters in a video game are, you know, they're just, they're not real. Whereas these are, they, at least they were built and they seem to have some sort of advanced understanding of, um, or advanced sort of life. They have artificial intelligence, just how much that goes or how far that goes is kind of up to the viewer to decide. Hmm. But, um, yeah, I was just very struck by how much it felt like this, particular form of Westworld was influenced by modern video games. Interesting so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. My question to y'all, though, would be if you if you were in this sort of, or you could go to one of these, this sort of a place, like a Westworld-type environment where you're in an open-world game experience, because I, I would love to do something like this just to actually, because they actually do craft. They craft all of these quests, and the funny part is so many people go there and they don't even want to do the actual quest, like the story. They want to play yeah. out the storylines that are made for them. They just want to, like, basically go there and, like, activate cheat codes and start shooting things like you do in GTA when you first just, start. Just like in real life, he said, depressed. <laughs> right, yeah. It's like you don't even want to play the game. You just want to, like, screw around and, like, shoot people. It's like, come on, guys. Um, but my question would be, if you're in that first room and they're giving you your, your gun and your uniform, you're getting ready to play this game, are you picking the white hat or the black hat? My instinct is go with the white hat. All right. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I always play <laughs> Paragon characters first. All right. And then on the second playthrough um, is whenever I play the, the black heart. Well, there and you if go. there's not enough robust difference, um, oh, there's, there's quite quit. a difference. I will say that. In this, in this experience, well, I mean, there's I mean, quite I mean, a <laughs> like, I'm talking Fallout here. <laughs> like, like, like on the second playthrough, whenever I play with Vixen Fox, because my evil yeah, character is yeah. always a woman. Um, I've never finished Fallout the second time. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? It doesn't matter which version of. I, I've never, I've never done the second playthrough with the with the evil character. I, I basically I just go down the path a little bit and let the nukes off, and then like ah, it was that was fun. <laughs> just it doesn't it doesn't compel me. So that's an easy mm. answer for me. Being cool. being being the messianic hero is is what I like. <laughs> I choose I, the brown hat. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, the, the hat of the gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd probably do this. I'd probably pick the white hat as well. But no. I just think it's it's very interesting. They do actually have like literally one human character that seems like a good person, and the rest are kind of you don't care about them. But um, I am kind of mm-hmm. interested to see where the show goes. A, a lot of TV shows can can do a really good job of getting um, raising all these interesting you know philosophical concepts, giving you this really cool build up, and then if they don't know where they're going with it, it just sort of peters out. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen here. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty. It's so far, I'm, it's a pretty good series. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward-compatible.com. We're going to close out the episode, or start to wind down the episode, by introducing this new topic. Mm. I am um, thankful for this new topic. We're calling this new segment uh, Inbox. We've actually already had an episode where someone commented and uh, suggested a topic for us, and yeah. we, we talked about the death of Couch Co-op games as a result of that. Um, but whenever we get comments from people that aren't necessarily full episodes... Um, say, for instance, you want to uh, respond to something we said on a show, or um, you almost would just want to write like a letter to the editors to sort of say what's on your mind. Um, we might take some of these things and respond to them here on Inbox. And so uh, we want to open this new segment with a comment that we got about uh, episode 80, uh, the developer's responsibility to consumers. Um, this comment comes from uh, Michael T. And I'll go ahead and read this real quick, and then we this can is, quickly... This uh, is from Mr. T.? We're getting yeah, a comment Mr. from Mr. T. Mr. T. <laughs> Wait, Sounds like a fake name. We, we can neither confirm nor deny that it is the real Mr. T. I'll say <laughs> that. Um, there Our we lawyers go. will not let us confirm or deny <laughs> that it's Mr. T. We love um, you, T. We love but, you. But uh, I'll go ahead and read his, um, his response real quick to this, and we can sort of uh, see if you guys have any comment on it. Um, <clears throat> so, Michael says... 
Uh, this is a topic that is pretty close to my heart. I'm an idealist when it comes to developer-player re relations. In a perfect world, developers should be able to work on an idea that they believe in and target players that have similar backgrounds of play or similar interests. These players, ideally of course, would be the best audience to provide meaningful feedback and criticisms to help the developers stay true to their idea whilst delivering content that their target consumers will enjoy. We don't live in a world, or we don't live in that world, and I doubt that we ever will. Uh, with that out of the way, there are great costs and tough decisions that developers have to make in order to get their vision, or the closest thing to it, out to their audience. If you go the corporate route, ROI is always going to be the driving factor. Why should a company invest funds without promise of something greater in return? Uh, that same company, publisher, firm, etc., will have shareholders and their own investors that they have to answer to. I doubt that spending millions of dollars and only breaking even is something that many investors will be willing to do, at least in my opinion. Bringing it down to, delect, uh, bringing it down to the direct-to-player level changes the type of investor a developer uh, will be able to attract. Currently, I feel that there are still some players... There's, there are still more players that do not understand the concept of investment into an idea or concept. Combine that uh, with the general lack of understanding on how games are made, and you will get a well-meaning but ill-informed consumer. To them, it appears to be, I like what I see and I want to have that what I see, plus whatever else will be there when the game is finished. This is not to say that every consumer or investor of this type is exactly like this, but my anecdotal experiences have led me to see this type of person over and over again when discussing Kickstarter, Steam, and Indiegogo game projects. Due to this, I will never purchase an alpha or a beta. I want a finished product as a consumer, and I am happy to pay the price for a finished product as a consumer, even if that means forfeiting potential or influencing uh, developers in a personal creative fashion. To start tying this all up, developers are on the tightrope of balancing player expectations with ROI, regardless of investment source. The thin line they walk on is their game idea. Tipping over into assured return of an on investment can lead to large swaths of dissatisfied players, with the project becoming less and less of a game and more and more of paywall to call paywalled content. Leaning too far over into the player side only dilutes the project with many voices and ideas. Feature creep could become rampant and users will form factions based around ideas they want to see implemented in-game. It's no longer your idea, but a curated community idea where not everyone will be happy with the decisions that are made. I assume the developers want to get an idea or a story they want to tell out to players. Developers aren't just making games because they just want to make something, there is a purpose. My motivation as a developer is just that. I have a story I want to tell people who like similar stories and similar mechanics that I like. Narrow band of user? Yes. Naive? Probably. Yeah, most likely. However, there's a certain benefit given to smartly locating your user base and providing them with content that lines up with their interests. The message or story may not go wide, but it has a higher chance of deeply affecting the players who do play, and I think that's really worth hmm. it. Yeah, I, so if I can just kind of give my initial thoughts, um, I, I have to agree wholeheart wholeheartedly with uh, what Mr. T here is saying. Um, I completely agree. I mean, that's kind of my thought on this concept of influencing really any sort of media, whether it's, it's film or novels or video games. So I feel that if you're if you are the creator, if you're the developer in this case, you should make something that that you are passionate about and that you feel is going to be um, something that you as a consumer would also love to play yourself in this case because we're talking about games. So if you feel like you're going to be excited to play this game, then you know that there's at least going to be other people like you that are going to want to play this game and love it. And if you try to make something that appeals to too many people, you're just going to dilute that and you're going to end up with something that is just average because what do you get when it appeals to a lot, to both extremes to everyone you get an average product if you want to if you want to really inspire someone else or you want to really have something that that can touch people you also have to accept that some people are going to hate what you make and that's fine mm. that's totally I'm actually, fine I'm reminded of an interesting quote I heard on the Writing Excuses podcast recently. Um, they had a guest on who's a uh, comedian, um, but she's done writing, and her comedy sketches tend to sort of address um, kind of like more sort of like semi-political things that she's experienced in her own life. And she says that um, the more specific you get, the broader the audience you'll reach. Um hmm. Or hmm. something like that. I forget the exact quote, but you know, paraphrasing it, basically, it's saying that the more detailed, the more specific you get to your own situation, the more people it's going to impact. Yeah, um, totally. Because if you if you are too generic, it's just going to delete the message, and people aren't really going to be able to latch on to it. Oh, I yeah. see. In, in yeah. terms of the the empathy we talked about last, exactly. Week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll they'll hear it, but they may not like. They might listen to it and go, "Okay, that's something," but you're not going to actually reach them in an impactful way, in like a meaningful way. I completely agree mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Well, in terms of the, the comment, um, I, I hear you, T. I do. <laughs> uh, 
uh, maybe in an, in a small independent uh, development company, that kind of thing. Um, especially if we're talking about something like um, you know Hello Games, cool, yeah, chase the dream. But in terms of uh, like a, a, a you know a title release. I just don't think it's practical. When you've got teams of 400, 500, 800 people making a game in a franchise series, um, well, that idea of being able to hire... Um, and, and, and honestly, I think this falls then on the hiring manager. Right, hiring people exactly. who are really passionate about that game, and, I think that's that's great. But is it going to happen? No. You're going to get drones who are like, um, yeah, I show up in my cubicle, I do my thing, I get my paycheck, I go home. Um, you're you're going to have those... But, Doc, you're going to have those people... But you need that visionary behind the product that can sort of give it that voice, right? Yes. I mean, isn't that sort and that's of what the art director or the creative director or those kinds of guys are for. Then, and 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 whenever we see that really shine in, in guys like you know Ken Levine, for example, uh, in Bioshock, then it 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 resonates for decades afterwards. I mean, Bioshock hasn't been around for decades, but um, you know these these really passionate uh, the Miyamotos, the you know that kind of thing. We, we understand them and we say their name and we're like, ah, yes. But I chose, I chose Levine very specifically because there are also examples where he's phoned it in. Sure. And it shows. Um, and, and that's not always been his fault. You know, he's been asked to leave projects and things like that. And then they've, they've gone off and, in weird and, directions. And what, what happens but, with, these, with these creative types, too, it's like if they, if they, um, if they feel like those, those people, their investors, are kind of forcing them to do something they don't really want to do. That's when they start phoning it in. Yep. Right. I mean, well, like they, they sort of push their product. Ultimately, it comes down to this: if you've got a producer um, who is the money executive producer, they're taking all the risk. Because they're taking all the risk, they have some right to be able to determine what the content is. It, you, what you really need to do as an artist who has a, a financial backer is mm-hmm. to find someone who shares your vision. And so, I think in that sense. That's what the most going to be the most important thing in those big projects is to find, uh, you know, a producer who's willing to take a risk on you for who you are, and you know we could look to actors and say they the actors who have the integrity to take parts that they believe in uh, are the greatest actors of all. You know we could look to uh, depths and, and pits and things like that to to, to, to illustrate that. But um, ultimately, I think that's where this comes to. You know, it takes one bad garbage game to ruin your career and that's strange because actors can make bad movies and no one cares you can still go on to make good movies hey i will say this m night Shyamalan has made tons of bad movies and he keeps getting work and i can't explain it. <laughs> so <laughs> well i mean you know um there's a special mystique <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. T, for your uh, for your uh, comment. And if any of you would like to write the show, um, you know, kind of a letter to the editor sort of thing, um, if you want to send some suggestions for topics or ask a question, uh, share an opinion that you might have, go ahead and send us an email. Um, the address that you're going to want to send it to is inbox at backward-compatible.com. Again, that's inbox at backward-compatible.com. And that's going to be our, our main way of sort of going through all of our stuff and making sure that um, we get the messages that need to be read and then can sort of sort through the ones that we want to go ahead and feature on the show. So um, go ahead and feel free to send us an email. I pity the fool that doesn't send us an email. <laughs> wow, no? That's a perfect impression, Jim. Right. I know. I'm, I'm so great at that. Yeah. Thank you. Spot on. <laughs> All right, and I think we are uh, just about hitting our time limit for this uh, wonderful Thanksgiving feast. So we'd like to thank everyone for joining us for episode number 84 of the BackwardDashCompatible.com podcast. I'm thankful for you guys. That's what I'm thankful for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, same no, actually, here. you know what I'm really thankful for? What I'm really thankful for is that, uh, that a release date has been announced for Horizon Zero Dawn. <laughs> um, and, and so that's really what I'm thankful for, more than you guys. Well, that's that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thankful for the uh, announcement of Red Dead Redemption 2. Ooh, Very timely. Yeah. Recently, Can I change my answer? recently no, announced. I don't want to change my answer. <laughs> yeah. Very and, excited uh, for that one. Okay, so 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 buy trash or no, <laughs> we'll do that later. <laughs> buy try, or trash. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe we can open with that next episode. Yeah, there you yeah. go. And uh, personally, uh, something we actually didn't get to talk about, Nintendo Switch. I'm uh, very excited oh, about yeah. that announcement. So. Yeah, me too. I never picked up the Wii U, but I might have to pick up a Switch. Mm-hmm. So very interesting, to, very interesting to see how that turns out. Yeah. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Don. I am Jim, coming in from the Satellite of Love. <laughs> and see you next time. Say hi to Tom Servo for me, would you? Yeah. I miss that guy. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. 
If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Stay compatible.